Thank you so much. And so um, for a brief overview for those who are new to AU or new to um, some of our support services, one of the um, key components of uh, the work of the Office of Latina Students is managing and implementing outward care networks. And so our care network, if you think about it as um, a student's experience, we are providing service and support in all facets of their experience here at AU. So we really take at the center of that, um, operating from a place of care and concern. Um, and we, we really want to approach our work in an interdisciplinary way, in a holistic way, recognizing that students are adults and sometimes that has uh, its benefits and its drawbacks, right? For anyone who has tried to track down a student um, via email or in person and they are ghosting you to use their language, not mine, um, it can be a little bit difficult, but that is also within their right as a student and as an adult who's on the students. So our goal is um, to try to work with them as early as possible to intervene when something may be difficult or maybe on their radar as something that's challenging and then help them find ways to advocate for themselves and develop some resiliency skills around how to thrive while here at AU and beyond AU. But we don't do that work alone. We are an office of just a handful of people and our work is influenced and shaped every day by the folks who are watching this call and those who were unable to join us today. So it is truly, it is a community effort. It is rooted in all of us. Um, and we, we truly believe that our students, um, they are worth right, our time, our energy and our commitment to stepping in when we think that something might be a little off or somebody could use a little bit more care and support. And so um, what that means for us is we're really trying to put those principles of that ethos of care into action every day for our students. And we, we think about that in every interaction we have. And so our office is working through this care network. We are working with all of you as our colleagues in that care work and support of students. And so our role is multifaceted and we are looking to both educate the community through, through conversations like this or down the line. If you have time that you would like us to spend with any of your teams, we're happy to do so. Um, and we want to promote well-being and we want students to understand that no one route to success and health and wellness looks the same. And so we're there to really help them find the ways to explore what is best for their path and their progress and normalizing that it's okay for that to change. What worked for somebody in their junior year of high school when they were stressed out about academics may look very different when they are now here at AU and potentially away from family for some of our students for the first time, right? And so we are really trying to carry forward the mission, vision, and values of the institution. We're trying to honor our students where they are at, both in all of the identities they hold, but then also in the passions that they are continuing to develop here. And ultimately, part of the really important work that we do does involve risk mitigation. When we have a community member or a student who's able to self-identify that something doesn't feel right, I feel off, or the behavior of my peer seems really different and I am concerned. They give us an opportunity to reach out to the student and say, not you're in trouble, why are you acting like this? But hey, someone else in this community thought you might benefit from some additional conversation. How can we help? How can we talk through what might be going on for you? And those are the ways in which everyone within our community help build that care network and help give us the opportunity to respond to students um, when for some of them, they're at um, sometimes the most difficult parts of an experience that they're, that they're managing. And so our care team, um, some of you may hear that phrase often, or you may work in offices that have um, members of your staff who participate in care team. Um, and it's, it's part of the way that we serve students and our commitment to serving students. And so our care team is, brought um, together every week um, with a group of campus partners who talk about some of our most high risk situations that students may be experiencing. And we, we do a lot of thought partnership on how to be innovative in terms of 
strategies to support that student, ways to make that connection, and to help students find a path forward from whatever it is that is causing them some level of distress. And part of um, what is really important for us is we have the privilege of calling into that work our health health um, and counseling center staff members. And so members from the well-being center and from our student health center participate and right they are closed loop. And so we often, um, or they have the privilege of listening to all of us um, talk at length oftentimes and to solicit their feedback to say, is there anything else we could be thinking about for this student? Are there further interventions that we can help connect a student to? And two of those really important big processes that a student may experience while they are with us um, is that it's sometimes a student needs a break. There is something going on for their medical health, for their mental health, and they need time away, whether it's because they've had a spleen rupture, which I hope is not the case for anybody on this call, or mm -hmm. quite frankly, any of our students moving forward, or they're having a really difficult time and they're maybe experiencing thoughts of suicide which can be really scary and really isolating. And we're trying to help them transition to whether that's part-time um, with a local outpatient program, or perhaps they're taking some time to be away from the university environment, away from their academics, and to take that break and, and work with the mental health team back wherever home is for them. And so we will support that student through their entire leave process. And so some of you may be familiar with when we have a student who needs to retroactively withdraw from us because of a medical circumstance that has arisen for them. And then also when they're returning. So we're, we're calling back in to, into our work with them. What is going on? How are you feeling about this return? What are the recommendations for your treatment team? And how can we make sure that those things are available to you here at AU? So a few of the offices that our um, team partners with continuously and folks who participate in our care team have just popped up on your screen. Um, and sometimes it takes being creative, right? If a student's recommendation from a provider is that they need equine therapy four times a week, um, we like to make sure that students know that we don't have a horse on kit and that they also cannot have one in their residence hall. My colleagues from residence life, we do not let them think. And so how do we find something that offsets um, what it is that the student is for. And how do we bring that into their work every day? So I'm gonna turn it over to Jimmy. Hey everybody, good. I'm gonna talk a little bit about academic alerts. And before I get started, you know, I wanted to give some shout outs. Uh, earlier this spring, um, a group of uh, colleagues got together and, and really got academic alerts back on, on the radar. And uh, I wanna credit Brad Knight and Adam Tomaszewski and Martin Oliver and then uh, Diane Palmer and Becca Comfort uh, with some follow-on work on that uh, to really start to clarify and crystallize the topic and I think serve as a pathway to get to this conversation today. So uh, kudos to those colleagues. I um, want to talk a little bit about what academic alerts are, the purpose and the process. You know, uh, at the very high level, it's a student-centered tool for faculty and instructors for, that's available uh, for all instructors, that the undergraduate, graduate, anyone that teaches a course has access to the academic alert system. Uh, the academic alert, first and foremost, is informational to the student. It's non-punitive. Um, it's a way for instructors to document concern about um, issues that they see in class that they observe around attendance, performance, or even engagement. Um, for us, and when we think about the big picture about why we have an academic alert program, um, part of it is to help normalize for students that it's okay to struggle. And in fact, when I ask first-year students um, what percentage of them are struggling at least one course in the first five weeks that they're here, 60% um, of students say they're struggling in a course already at, at that week five point. And in fact, 40% of students are struggling in two courses or more. And so to struggle at AU is pretty typical. You wouldn't necessarily know that or feel that based on how students often position and present themselves to you and to us, but, but that is the case. Um, and then importantly, academic alerts are not part of the student's official record and they don't appear anywhere on student transcripts. Uh, it's an administrative um, internal note to students and to the community of supports that can potentially help a student uh, that a faculty member or instructor has observed something in class that they wanna bring attention to. Um, the next thing is that 
Uh, academic alerts, of course, most useful when they're given early. And in fact, uh, AU has a history of calling academic alerts, which is its nomenclature now, early warnings in the past. When it was called early warnings, a couple things happened. One is that faculty instructors would only do them early. And then we had a big gap, uh, kind of mid to late, of faculty not feeling like they had a way to be able to uh, provide uh, feedback and, and notify the student and also those communities that can help them that something is going on and, and they should bring attention to it. Um, so now we call them academic alerts, and it's been that way for about three or four years now, and I, I believe. Um, when I think about the different times of the year when academic alerts are useful and, and what's happening, I'd say during like weeks one through five, weeks one through five, an academic alert leads to opportunity. I think opportunity for the student to seek proactive ways to make adjustments, uh, to make big improvements, big changes uh, that can really set them up, set themselves up to rally in a major way, you know, to have a slow start, but then finish strong. Um, really, the whole semester is in front of them during those first five weeks. The next period, let's say week six to 10, um, that's less about opportunity and more about choices. At that point, when a student gets an academic alert, they have to start making some hard choices. I mean, severe shifts in behavior, severe shifts in prioritization of time and effort. And then that week 10 is an important time because too, because that's a, uh, the last week that students can withdraw from a course uh, without um, with, with a W uh, at that point. So um, it's, it's, it's an important moment at that time. And so week six through 10, that really is about um, choices, you know, making the choice to, to really dig in and go for it, but understanding that options are limited. Um, a lot of time has elapsed and a lot of times you're in the home stretch of, of trying to make those adjustments. And the last part, academic alerts are welcome all semester long. You know, whenever we have an occasion to do it, we should do it uh, as an instructional community. But weeks 11 to 15, really at that point, that's about accountability. You know, it's helping the student understand that they have to set realistic expectations about what's possible this semester in that class and in their academic experience. And then to kind of give students the encouragement and the nudge to start making plans for what comes next. Um, and so it's a little bit different uh, there in the last period. And then the last thing that I'll say just about the process is that um, whenever uh, instructors submit an academic alert, what happens is in kind of a, when, when you go in the system, you see exactly what the student is going to be getting. The system shows you when you're entering uh, your information and your comment, um, what the email is going to look like that's going to go back to the student once you complete it. Um, that academic alert generates a personalized email to the student that has that instructor comment provides uh, links and reference to our academic coaching team, and then also provides the students personalized actual advisor contact information to be able to make a connection and contact at that point as well. So the whole thing is personalized directly to that student from that faculty member. Now, who gets CC'd on that email? The academic advisor does, the student does, and of course the faculty gets record of it as well. In addition, um, the registrar's department gets a notification as well. Um, what happens next is that that information now exists administratively, and we will bring it into environments in which um, people can use it, for example, academic advisors. And so the academic advising CRM system we have is called CRM Advise, and that starts to populate for them information about students as it relates to academic alerts on student profiles, on administrative dashboards, and so forth, so that we can start to have that awareness of what's going on with the student as it relates to academic alerts. And then for us, our hope is that this can be the start of an important feedback loop where, um, um, uh, where it avoids what we hope to um, miss, which is uh, students struggling so mightily in a course or for a period of time, whether in academic learning or academic probation or, 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 or do poorly on the course. Um, and so our hope is that we can engage students early for them to make the adjustments in order to um, reach the educational goals that they set out for themselves. Okay. Wanted to give you some information about the, the use of academic alerts over the years. And so there's a lot going on here, but let me just orient you to this chart that I have. On the left, um, you will see the count of alert submissions from instructors. And so that goes from zero to 1400 uh, is that scale. And then across the bottom, you see terms, fall 2020, spring 21, and so forth. Uh, I mark off um, on our chart here, that uh, we were online exclusively for the most part from fall 2020 to spring 2021. So that's important context to understand what was happening during those terms. 
Okay, so let's take a look at the lines now. The purple line is academic alert submissions, and these are the actual academic alerts. These are not account of students. These are account of alerts. Um, and you can see that in fall 2020, we had 954 alerts um, given to, under, or to undergraduate students, degree seeking undergraduate students. Um, let's look at spring 2022. That was a high point. There were 1,203 academic alerts um, submitted for students that were degree seeking undergraduates. Um, going from spring 21 to spring 22, uh, I have a notation there that that represents a 33% increase in the count of academic alerts that were submitted uh, by instructors during that time. And then if you look from spring 22 to spring 23, we tracked a 12% decrease in academic alerts that were um, submitted during that same period. Staying on that purple line, um, I wanted to highlight the two asterisk points just as other bits of context. Fall 2020 was the first year cohort where it was the smallest first year cohort that we had in a decade plus. It was, um, in, it was 1,500 some students in that cohort. Um, typically we were seeing um, first year student counts of 17 to 1,800, but that year was 1,500 something. In fall 21, I have another asterisk there because that was the semester of our largest cohort ever in the history of AU for first year students. Now, remember this line represents all degree seeking undergraduate students, but I wanted to give you a sense of the first year student weight uh, for each one of those. Um, that size of that cohort, just for uh, people's reference, was 2,300 students that year in the first year cohort. If you remember that semester, that year being difficult and challenging and busy, it was. You are you are right that it was. Um, the pink line describes uh, academic alert submissions um, for any other kind of student. So these could be grad students, non-degree seeking students, and et cetera. And something interesting there is that when we were online modality that fall 2020, there were a lot. And so I got to dig into the numbers there about what was happening there. Look at that, 745 submissions for all other kinds of students that weren't degree seeking during that time. But then otherwise, it's been pretty steady, you know, in that 300 student range over the last few semesters. So just wanna give you a sense of the prevalence of academic alerts uh, over time. Um, now, we'll go back real quick, Ash, real quick. Um, I don't have the total number of classes <laughs> that we offered in each one of these terms, but looking at that purple line for a second, let's just imagine that there's 8,000 um, degree seeking students and each student takes five classes. That's 40,000 sections, right? 40,000 classes. Um, so that gives you some sense of the count of academic alerts, maybe relative to uh, an imagined amount, the total amount of classes that um, degree-seeking students might have taken that semester. Okay. Another uh, chart, just from a data point of view, um, is the next slide. And here, um, the purple bars are the count of courses where students earned a D or an F in the course. So let's take a look at fall 22. That semester, there were 1,150 grades of Ds or Fs uh, for degree seeking undergraduates. And then what I put in with the pink line there is the percentage of those sections with Ds and Fs that also had an accompanying academic alert from the instructor. And then you see over the years, it's about 30%. About 30% of courses in which students earn a D or F are also accompanied by a academic alert for that section of that course for that student. So just the yeah, background information about, um, about the prevalence of alerts within Ds and Fs. And then uh, this is the last that I'll, I'll say on this before uh, giving it back to Ash and, and, and Justin. Um, I think how many of us understand the academic alert system is that All it starts right. with yeah, faculty submitting. Yeah, like there soon. Wait, hold on a second. Yeah, because like me and Naya and then my niece is coming too. So there's like no space at Salim. So like um, uh, my aunt, I'm so happy my aunt is going to surprise my mom there too. Hey, Justin. 
Can you mute if you're not muted, folks? Thank you. I just went through and muted anybody who was unmuted, Jimmy, so you should be good. Hey, uh, so a couple of things. Uh, I'm looking in the chat now. So yeah, each student, um, you know, takes the, Kimberly, you're thinking about the right way. That was kind of like back of the napkin for me. I was just trying to, I don't have the total count of students plus classes, but it's it's a big number. <laughs> it's a big number. I guess the takeaway for that first slide was that we don't see many academic alerts relative to how much we know that students do struggle and how many classes that they take. And so uh, don't hold me on those on the fly numbers, but yeah, it's um I think relatively we 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 don't see many alerts, all things considered, uh, maybe is the takeaway. Um, and then uh, on coming back to this slide here, um, I think the process as many of us understand it. Uh, and then for the record, I am I am like an ambassador for the academic alert program. Uh, I don't own it. Uh, I'm like its PR person. I would say today, um, it's spokesperson, um, uh, it's advocate, maybe it's champion. Uh, and so uh, know that. Um, I have lots of questions about the system, uh, what we're doing, but I'm invested and interested. And so uh, you're kind of get that, you're getting that spokesperson um, uh, contribution for me today. But here's how I think a lot of folks understand the system. You know, the first is that faculty submit academic alerts. We know that it generates that email back to faculty, to the advisor, and then AU gets information about that alert, okay? And the student does, of course, as well. Depending on the context, um, I think a lot of us believe that advising and advisors will receive that information then in, if needed, might reach out to the student. A lot of times advisors are already in contact with students that are experiencing academic struggle and so it could be redundant. Other times it just might not be necessary because it is just so early or maybe so, um, yeah, it's, it's not always the case that, that they might get an outreach from an advisor. Um, and then I think there is a, wait, hold on Ash real quick. I think that there is an assumption uh, that our academic coaching team reaches out to every student that gets an academic alert. They do not. Students are given the information for academic coaching um, in the email that gets sent to them, and it's one click away for them to take that action. But it is up to the student to consult and connect with the academic coaching team. Now, the, why is that? It would just be redundant. They get this academic alert that tells them, hey, uh, contact academic coaching, here's the link. And then would it make sense for the academic coaching team to send an immediate email after that says, hey, here's the link again. It, it doesn't. So it was redundant in that way. Um, last year, though, what the academic coaching team did do, though, was to look at the administrative record of the count of academic alerts the students were receiving. And if they were getting more than one, like two, three or more, then they, they would do specialized outreach to that student to try to get them um, uh, to come in. Okay, so here's expanding our sense. Like, here's what I hope. So this is the next one. I hope, and this doesn't happen often, is that the student takes initiative and connects with faculty, advisor, academic coach. So that's the wish. The red, the pink, that's the wish. Um, and then how might that happen more often, given this new um, reality, is potentially in the hands of our faculty and our instructors. Um, and this tracks back to some of the conversations that I was referencing at the start of the uh, presentation. Um, is that, you know, what would it look like early on for faculty to discuss academic alerts at the start of a class and say, hey, thanks for a class, look forward to working with you. Let me tell you about a system that I might engage with if I notice that you're struggling. Academic alerts, here's what happens, here's what to expect. I think if we seed students with that notion, that idea that that could come and that might happen, that might that at the end of the process get them to take those steps that we need. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, that'd be interesting to see. So um, so that's, I think right now it's like the purple, but I think if we expand it out a little bit, maybe with the dark red, and then um, on the left, we can maybe get the outcome we want on the right, which is students taking initiative to, 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 to move forward. All right, and then final thoughts and reminders. Um, just one idea that I have is maybe every section, every semester. And what I mean by that is, you know, for an instructor, what about for every section, every semester, observing one student that might benefit from receiving um, an academic alert, so to engage the campus, to, to nudge them to take steps? What would it look like? Could it be possible that every instructor, every section, every semester, at least does that for one student they might think might benefit? Um, accessing academic alerts, just want to give a reminder that it's in the AU portal. Um, you go to Eagle Service, academic alerts is an option, and then there's a button there, so there's academic alert, and then that's how you would enter it there, and it's a what you see is what you get kind of process to fill out the form. 
And then just some key dates. Remember the first two weeks, students can add courses. They can also drop courses without a W. So the first two weeks is a key period for students to make some decisions about enrollment. And then at the end of the 10th week, that's the last day to withdraw from a course or change a grade option. And so uh, getting an academic alert information to students prior to that 10th week can also be a wise move as well. I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. And um, I just wanted to um, raise up one question that was in the chat about how often faculty are reminded um, to send academic alerts, particularly in the first 10 weeks prior to the withdrawal deadline. Um, prior to being in the Dean of Students office, I was in the School of Communication. Um, I can attest that um, in addition to the reminders that come from, um, that will soon come from Bridget and Wendy, um, to all faculty about the academic alert system as well as the care network. Um, each school and college um, sends their own reminders as they see fit throughout the semester to their faculty. So I would encourage folks to um, ask their uh, schools and colleges and department heads um, to send out those reminders frequently throughout the semester because um, the sooner folks know, the, the better off it will be. And it's great that the system also, you know, that advisors get copied because then they can also see, oh, this student has an academic alert in four out of their five classes. That's concerning, you know, um, maybe intensify the outreach. Um, unfortunately, of course, you can't compel students to um, want to do better in their classes or to want to take up the resources that we offer them. Um, but this, uh, the academic alert system is a really great tool. Um, and with that, let's talk about ways that we can invite students into conversations about how they're progressing. Um, I love the slide. I think it's a really great visual that kind of shows all the things that our students are balancing, whether it's um, things in the classroom or illnesses that they're experiencing, mental health concerns they might have, physical health concerns, um, situations that are going on in the residence halls with their roommates, um, and their academic performance. So um, that's a lot to put on to one person's plate. Um, so as a faculty member or a staff member who's having an interaction with the student, um, ways that you might invite students into conversations are when you notice that there are substantial changes in their academic performance, um, when they make direct statements about things that are going on with them, their family, their friends, um, changes in their social activities or their work activities, um, when the students um, are expressing um, themselves in more um, volatile ways, so maybe they're more agitated, more withdrawn, um, more animated. When peers express concerns about a student, a lot of times faculty hear from other students, hey, I heard so-and-so told me that, you know, they were cutting. Um, that would, of course, be an, an invitation to both of those students to be part of a conversation. Um, when you see physical changes in a student, maybe they gain a lot of weight, lose a lot of weight, um, are appearing disheveled in class. Um, if they are having trouble concentrating or engaging with their peers and activities in the classroom, group assignments, things like that. Um, and then, of course, when you hear about significant life events, they tell you that they had a death in their family or, you know, they suffered um, damage from a hurricane in their family home. Um, those kinds of things would all be great um, times to start conversations with students, which might be paired with an academic alert if you're noticing a change in their academic performance and might also be paired with a care report, depending on um, what the concern is. Um, so with that, I think it's a great place to turn to our case study. Um, so um, this is a case study that is in four parts. So we'll go through it piece by piece after each part. I'll give folks a few minutes to reflect on their own, um, maybe respond to the prompts in the chat. Um, you can, of course, you know, raise your hand or unmute and share with the group if you feel comfortable. Um, so here's part one. Jane attended the first two class sessions and then did not attend class or respond to Professor Smith's emails for the next four weeks. Jane is still uh, showing on the class roster and other students in the class have told the professor that they've seen Jane in TDR recently. So what, if at all, is your level of concern for this student? So take a few minutes, think about it. Um, feel free to pop things into the chat. And um, also feel free to unmute in a few seconds, in a few minutes.
So I'm seeing in the chat um, a level of concern about the ability of, for the student to pass the class. And um, high level of academic concern, moderate level of concern about the health and well being of the student. Student disengagement can be an expression of trauma or a major incident. So um, this ranges, you know, from pretty high level of concern to maybe concern, but not necessarily having all of the information to know how concerned to be about things other than the student's ability to pass the class. The student needs a check-in, maybe a, if this were like a red light, yellow light, green light, it would be a yellow. Students don't always know um, how to or when to drop a class. That's an excellent point. So we, you know, obviously are much more attuned to the academic calendar and to deadlines and things like that. So um, maybe the student just didn't know what they were supposed to do. So let's move on to part two. Jane comes to class seven and Professor Smith pulls Jane aside in the hallway before class starts to find out where Jane has been for the past several weeks. Jane tells Professor Smith that she has been, quote, dealing with the mental health stuff, end quote. So now what's your level of concern? And what, if any, actions would you take? And what questions might you have for this student? Submitting a care report, that's always uh, a good idea in these kinds of situations, and we can talk more about that in a moment. Asking what sorts of support the student needs right now. An academic alert sharing the student's ability to pass the class, likelihood of their ability to pass this class. Asking for a one on one conversation and offering support. Sharing resources. High level of concern, submitting a care report, and um, ask what support the student needs. Explaining to the student the academic challenge of passing the course at this point. So now we're getting into kind of Sounds like there's academic concerns as well as more mental health um, care concerns. So um, it sounds like folks might be doing two, using both systems at the same time, which is totally acceptable and encouraged. So we'll move on to part three. Jane misses class eight and nine, but comes to class 10. She still has not submitted any of the course assignments for the semester. Jane misses class 11. Her partner for the final project informs Professor Smith that they have not been able to reach Jane to divide up work. Jane has not responded to Professor Smith's emails. So now what's her level of concern? Is it higher? Um, are you taking any additional steps to try to support this student? And do you have any other questions for this student? Is there information that, that you're missing that you um, need to have before you can take further action? High level of concern, both care report and academic alerts. Justin, can I highlight um, a comment here in the chat from Matt? Um, or Matt included the phrase or update thereof. Um, I will say we certainly have folks who have submitted care reports that have continued concern for a student. And you are absolutely encouraged to reach out to the person who is managing that student's case to say, hey, I've not seen a change at all. Do you have any updates that you can share? Because that also gives us really good information about what responsiveness the students may or may, or may not be engaging in as it relates to your initial concern. 
Yeah, that's a great point, Ash. Thank you. Reassigning the partner. Um, so now you might have concern for another person who's being impacted by what is happening with the student. An additional academic alert, an additional care report, um, making sure the professor understands what kinds of grades would be appropriate. In this instance, perhaps an FX might be appropriate, which um, our academic folks can certainly address um, more what that's, that grade means. Okay, and we'll move on to part four before we wrap things up. So Jane comes to class 12 and tells Professor Smith she's still, quote, dealing with mental health stuff. She tells Professor Smith she has not sought medical attention and she has not met with anyone from the Office of the Dean of Students or her academic advisor. So now what's your level of concern and what actions might you be taking? Dropping in to see the academic advisor, that's an, uh, an interesting approach. So um, if the student's not gonna see the advisor, maybe trying to get some information firsthand from the advisor yourself as the professor. Walking a student over to the Center for Wellbeing Programs, formerly the Counseling Center. Help them call to make an appointment or help them schedule the appointment while they're with you. Um, sit and call the advisor if you can together. That's an interesting, um, I think sometimes students don't realize how much we all know each other and all work together and can easily just, you know, teams each other or get on the phone with each other. So um, I think sometimes they're a little caught off guard when that happens and it's, it can really help motivate them to take action because they're like, oh, Justin just called the academic coach Amanda who said that they can see me like this afternoon. So um, I guess I should probably go and do that now that it's week 12. Um, so all of the answers that folks have shared in the chat are correct. Um, I will say this is an actual case that I dealt with when I was the instructor for a class this spring. Um, so, um, you know, using all of the resources at hand is, um, is really helpful. There are it started off certainly as an academic concern, not showing up to class, not doing assignments, um, kind of grew into you know, mental health concern and wanting the student to have resources. Um, and then of course got a, a much more um, acute concern once it was apparent the student wasn't actually taking any actions to get support um, and was kind of continuing to deteriorate both um, in terms of their health as well as their, their mental health as well as their academic health. Um, so having the, um, the support of the academic advisors and using the academic alert system as well as the, the care system and making sure the student is connected to resources. But again, it is incumbent on the student to actually access the resources. So we can submit academic alerts and care reports every day, all day, as much as we want. If the student doesn't actually want to take action, besides, you know, walking them over in the middle of class to the resource and having them sit down and try to use the resource. Um, you can't really make them do it. They have the right to, to not to use our resources and to not do well um, in their classes or to let their mental health or physical health um, deteriorate. So um, I, I think a lot of times faculty and staff are discouraged when they aren't feeling like they're getting, like the student is actually responding to their outreach through these systems. Um, but there's only so much that you all can do. Um, and there's certainly only so much that each of our offices can do as well. So um, next slide, Ash. Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. So with all of the good observations you're making every day with our students and all of the information um, that each of us carry, right? We, our students and their experiences are individualized, but they're also sort of like a giant puzzle. And each of us, if we're lucky enough, we get a piece of what that student's experience is. And so the goal of all of these observations and putting them into an academic alert or into the care network care report is to make a fuller picture of that student's experience. 
So what happens if you do find yourself submitting a care report? After a care report is submitted, um, it is reviewed by our team, um, Justin, myself, and our colleague, uh, Jaris Williams. We rotate through reading every single care report that comes through every day. And so that is a Monday to Friday process. So for those of us, when we take over on a Monday, it's typically a heavier caseload, unsurprising to probably many of you um, on a Monday morning. So we're gonna review that and we're gonna make sure that it's fitting the category that is most appropriate. Sometimes we have students who report things that are actually strictly a conduct concern, or they're maybe experiencing some sort of relationship disruption and um, or bias that they're experiencing. And so we're gonna to wanna to get those types of reports that fall under equity in Title IX appropriately to that office. And so we will make a referral of that report directly to equity in Title IX so that it doesn't slow down the student's ability to receive um, resources and to receive outreach and support. So when a care report is held internally um, that is assigned to one of our case managers or to one of our uh, one of our deans, and we will send to the person who has sent the report, we will we will give you a general acknowledgement of the report being received. It's starting to be processed, and it will also include the contact information for the person to whom the case is assigned. And so if you have questions about where where is this case going or the student hasn't made any change or they're making really really strange requests now and it's gone like above and beyond what i believe i can provide as a faculty member and it's gone above and beyond what what really is possible and i'm trying to help set some um we will take as much information as possible to to route back with that student and to help them understand um, sort of the, the broad scope of, of what is happening within the experience of their, um, the context of their experience and within the classroom or um, social setting. Um, but ultimately, as Justin and uh, as Jimmy have both mentioned, whether it's an academic alert or a care report, the student needs to decide to engage with us, right? And so that becomes a, a critical part. Um, you, you can't have early intervention without the student being willing to engage with you on the intervention. And so we will respond with our best ability to make contact with that student, to employ the resources of our colleagues, see if there's connections through partner offices, or if the student lives in a residence hall, can we work with our residence life team to get somebody in front of the student if it's more urgent. And then we coordinate that intervention and we resolve the report um, when we are able to do so. And sometimes, that report is concluded by saying a student has refused outreach to us. We can see that they reviewed a letter, but they're not engaging with us. And so that becomes part of um, that process in the, the life cycle of the report as well. Um, Christina, I see your hand raised, and so I'd like to invite you to go ahead and um, to pop your question on in. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about just the process. I know that when a care report is submitted, um, it, it's assigned to a case manager. And then I do, because I, I have submitted several of these as I'm sure others have. Um, and I do get the general email just acknowledging um, that you know it's being worked on, but I'm just wondering like, what is the process or how is it decided of how updates are given to the reporting person? Because I usually may not hear an update about the care reports that I submit. Um, and so um, just, just for clarity purposes, are, do we need to follow up to get an update or do you guys ever reach back out to give updates? That's a great question, Christina. Um, so typically we are not providing any updates to a reporting person. We're treating that student's uh, record and case as something that is private unless we need to pull other folks back in or provide information back to Oftentimes, the reporting party might hear from us after you've received um, the initial acknowledgement email. If we have additional questions, um, if oh, there oh, are this, other pieces oh, that we are trying yeah, to um, sort of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. That's really Thanks, Teddy. Uh, if we are trying to gather more information, um, or to employ maybe a different tactic, right? If a student has 
um, been really engaged with you and are giving you specifics, I might say, can we try to strategize and can you ask these two questions to try to get them to read my email or to try to get them to call back in to the work with me. Um, and so we, we typically wouldn't circle back um, with any details about the student's experience uh, because that very quickly becomes um, also uh, part of that student's record. And so without release from the student for some of those specifics, depending on what it is that they're sharing or their level of outreach, uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't um, sort of breach that level confidentiality with, without for them. And then I know we are getting close to time and I see another hand or two up. And so I'm gonna move on to our um, last one and a half slides and then turn it over to students for the group. So one thing that's um, really important to know is all of the hard work um, that has gone into uh, a year and in, into supporting our students does not go unnoticed. Um, many of you may have received um, the Dean of Students thank you message um, that came towards the end of the spring semester uh, with a brief summary of the year in review of reports. And we had just shy of 3,900 care reports submitted. And that's just the report itself. And so if you think about that as every student that we then reach out to and the unique students that we were able to interact with was just over 2,500 students based on those reports alone. Um, you can see the common referrals that we make back out uh, for students and the places that they are drawing the most support from. And then also the number of letters for some of you, I know some of you who are faculty members of the faculty, you've probably seen my name a lot because I know every once in a while I'm sending letters and I'm seeing the same faculty member that I'm like, oh, wow, they are instructing everybody who has been on my radar this week. Like, how did that happen? And so thank you for continuing to do the hard work and continuing to push the support and options forward for your students. Um, I don't think that any one of our students is sitting back thinking that they are not being supported by the people that are around them here on campus. They may be experiencing some things that are causing them to think that, um, but when it comes down to the hard work of it all, students more often than not are saying, my faculty, my advisor, my, my peers have been so supportive and I just don't, I don't know what to do with it or don't feel deserving of that support. So we try to have a frame for them. So thank you for all that you have done um, over the course of the past year and, and all that will happen uh, in the course of the next one. And so I will open it back up um, to questions. Um, so anyone with a raised hand, feel free to unmute as you're ready. I'm going to stop screen sharing so it's not still up here on all y'all's um, screen. So Ash, we are also done. Time to start our second session. So um, if folks are able to stay for the second round.